Hey everybody, this is Mrs. Velasquez, and we're ready to kick off our next flip lecture, which is going to focus on the legacy of ancient Greece and Rome. I'll put the correct title on. Uh, the legacy of ancient Greece and Rome. So this flip lecture is going to give you some background notes on this subject and tie it to our discussion of government and overall the development of democracy. Now notice again the second um, title up here is Judeo-Christian Tradition. Please keep in mind one of our next lessons for week three will also have you reading a short piece out of the textbook and answering a series of anticipation guide questions. All right. So finally, before I begin, just uh, also please make sure you have your notebook or again your section of your notebook devoted to your e-learning world history notes. These notes will be essential to look over before you open your um, Legacy of Ancient Greece and Rome uh, weekly quiz. The quiz will be 10 questions total, so you want to use the, your notes and make sure you can um, access those readily. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So first things first, again, I've always um, started off the discussion of this topic really with the essential question, why do we need this? Again, if we're going back to looking at um, why we study history, right, we're trying to understand uh, a purpose, not just memorizing ancient names and philosophers and definitions, but really thinking about the purpose. So if we're talking about government, which we looked at, which is a way to control society, protect society, thinking about who makes the rules, one of the ways, one of the forms of government is something called democracy. So the Greeks are the ones that developed democracy. And we're also in this flip lecture going to talk about the, what the Romans added to representative government. All right, so when we start talking about um, Greece and looking at specifically Athens building democracy, we flash back to, again, 2000 BC, and this is when the Greeks established cities in the small fertile valleys along the Greek rocky coast. Each city-state had its own government, and we've already defined government that is a system for controlling society. Now, the Greek city-states adopted many styles of government, so some terms I put on the slide right now just to refresh your memory, okay? In some, they had a person called a king or a monarch ruled a government. We talked about that earlier. That's called a monarchy. Other city-states adopted something called an aristocracy. And an aristocracy is a government ruled by a small group of noble, usually land-owning families. So these are people that have wealth, have land, have title, have power. Later, as trade expanded, the new wealthy class of merchants, people that, again, engaged in trade, they emerged in some cities. Sometimes these groups took the power and shared it with the nobility, and they formed an oligarchy. So an oligarchy is referred to a government that's ruled by a few powerful people. Now, ancient Greece civilization claims that they have the special distinction of developing the first democracies in the country. So, in fact, the word democracy we've talked about meaning rule of the people. So, power to the people in that case. So, we focus on Athens. Athens was actually the largest and most powerful city-state emerging in Greece. In Athens, citizens participated in government decision-making. So, citizens were adult male residents who enjoyed certain rights and responsibilities. So, that's an important distinction there. When we talk about citizen who gets rights and responsibilities. We're not talking about slaves. We're not talking about women in any case. So we're talking about adult males. And each year, an assembly of citizens elected about three nobles to rule the city-state. And after a year of service, for example, the nobles became part of a larger council of advisors. But, you know, as all civilizations in ancient history, we, we look back in about 600 BC, Athens suffered some severe economic problems, and they were struggling. So in order to pay their debts, poor farmers pledged a part of their crops to wealthy landowners. Now, then they sold themselves into slavery and were not able to leave the land. All right, when we talk about um, the ancient Greece, we also talk about, again, some reformers or some people that really get credit for making dramatic changes in ancient Greek democracy. So the first one, again, in about 594, Solon, 
a respected statesman, passed laws outlawing slavery based on debt. So debt, remember, we're talking about if you owe someone something. And it actually canceled out farmers' debts. So the fact that he got rid of everybody's bills and debt, this simple act enabled Athens to avoid revolution and civil war because there was so much fighting and tension. Solon continued his policies of political reform or change, and he established four classes of citizenship based on wealth rather than heredity. So heredity, we're talking about the fact that, again, you have to be born into it, right? It's passed down. So in this case, if you're able to work hard, have your own business, save your money, right? If you collect wealth, you're also to you're also able to obtain status of citizenship. So only citizens of the three higher classes were able to hold public office, though. So that's important. Yet even the lowest class of citizen could vote in the assembly. So all free adult males were citizens, and Solomon created a new council of four hundred. Now this body he prepared business for the already existing council. And he also introduced the legal concept that if any citizens could bring charges against wrongdoers, which is, is pretty big deal. So you don't have to wait for someone else or a council or someone higher up, higher up to make the charge. If you see someone again and they've committed a crime, you are able to uh, bring charges against them. So some of those acts I just mentioned, even though um, it increased participation in the government, I, we want to be careful here. Athens still had a limited democracy, right? Under Stalin, only citizens could participate in government. And only about one-tenth of the population were about citizens at the time. All right, the second uh, person you need to be familiar with is Clinthenes. Clinthenes, in this case, beginning in 1808, um, introduced further reform. So he kind of took it the step further. Because of this, he, this is important, hint, hint, uh, is generally regarded as the founder of democracy. He's the one that actually made Athens a full democracy by recognizing the assembly to balance the power of the rich and the poor. And he also increased the power of the assembly by allowing all citizens to submit laws for debate and passage. So Clinton Z's created the Council of 500. Now the council he created proposed laws and counsel to the assembly and the council members were chosen at random for any one of the citizens. So it's not a special privilege, again, at random. These reforms allowed Athenian citizens to participate in a limited democracy. However, again, only one-fifth of Athenian residents were actual citizens. All right, and the last figure that I want to introduce here, a uh, noted reformer for democracy, is Pericles. So Pericles strengthened Greek democracy by increasing the number of paid public officials and by paying jurors. Now, this actually allowed people to participate in the government, right? So if you think about it, previously people with money, it wasn't an issue for them to have the ability to go to the Senate or go to council, vote, make decisions, serve on a jury, uh, because again, they have money. They don't have to think about farming their fields or working in a some sort of profession to try to bring food and, and money to their families. So the fact that, again, he allowed people to get paid for these positions, more people are able to take these positions. So more people are participating in the government. And, and that's the definition, right? That's the definition of democracy. So through this greater participation, this is when we really start seeing that definition of direct democracy. All right, I also want to talk about a little about besides those reformers I just mentioned, I also want to introduce our Greek philosophers. So Greek philosophers also have a lot to contribute when we're talking about the development of the democracy. So it's about 4th century BC when they started, we call them the, the philosophers or the Greek thinkers appeared. So philosophers, the, the um, names you probably recognize, for example, we'll talk about Socrates in a minute. Um, so these men use logic and reason to investigate nature of the universe, right? What is the universe? Where are we? Who are we? Human society, right? People in general. And the concept of morality. Okay, so morality in the sense, you know, good, uh, bad, right, wrong. 
So these Greek thinkers use their philosophies and they kind of based it on the, the following assumptions. One, the universe, if I go back there, the land, the sky, the sea is put together in an orderly way, right? There's structure, there's, there's a plan, there's, if we take the time to think about it, um, you know, the universe is, has absolute and unchanging laws we can study. And number two, people can also understand these laws through using their own logic and reason. So using your own brain, your own rationale, your own analysis, your own thinking. The Greeks' respect for human intellect and intelligent and the power of reason allowed the ideas for democracy to flourish. So the first one on the screen right now, the first of the great philosophers was Socrates. And Socrates encouraged his students to examine most of their closely held beliefs. He used a question and answer approach that became known as the Socratic method. So perhaps in some of your classes, you've used a strategy, maybe uh, teachers refer to it as a Socratic circle. So in this case, Socrates would never support, shame on me, a direct lecture, right? For me, for, for students uh, to understand material, they should not be listening to a teacher, he would argue. What Socrates would probably have us do more often, which some of our lessons will have you do, just pay attention, um, in which that you will be reading a text or thinking about something, asking questions and engaging in a discussion. So Socrates, that says, um, that's when true learning occurs. So if we were all sitting down in a lecture hall and say, hey, Mrs. Velasquez, we want to know about Greek democracy and we have questions. And then we discuss and then I ask you questions and we build on those questions. And that's really how you get to that deeper level. So again, he's encouraging students not to accept the simple answers. So in anything in life, right, you have to question it. You have to use those historical questioning or inquiry questions we introduced last week. So questioning people, questioning society, questioning rights, questioning laws, right? That's something that we build on for democracy.